holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. I was glad when they said unto me, We will go into the house of the Lord. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth, that they may lead me and bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy dwelling. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we chiefly so to do, when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, kneeling if you are able, and saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us, but thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Now let us stand as we sing together the vain pay, which you will find on page 11. Excuse me, page 9. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us hardly rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth. 
remaining standing for the reading of the psalm. Our psalm for this morning is number 145. You will find Psalm 145 on page 520 of the Book of Common Prayer. We will read the psalm responsively, breaking at the asterisk. Psalm 145. I will magnify thee, O God, my King. And I will praise thy name forever and ever. Every day will I give thanks unto thee. And praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and marvelous, worthy to be praised. There is no end of his greatness. One generation shall praise thy works unto another. And deliver thy power. As for me, I will be talking of thy worship, thy glory, thy praise, and wondrous works, so that men shall speak of the might of thy marvelous acts. And I will also tell of thy greatness. The memorial of thine abundant kindness shall be showed. And men shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, long-suffering and of great goodness. The Lord is loving unto every man. And his mercy is over all his works. All thy works praise thee, O Lord. And thy saints give thanks unto thee. They show the glory of thy kingdom. And talk of thy power. That thy power, thy glory, and mightiness of thy kingdom might be known unto men. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion endureth throughout all ages. The Lord upholdeth all such as fall. And lifteth up all those that are down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, O Lord. And thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand. And fillest all things living with plenteousness. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. And holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him. Yea, all such as call upon him faithfully. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will love them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him. But scattereth abroad all the ungodly. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. And let all flesh give thanks unto his holy name forever and ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Please be seated. Here begin at the 31st chapter of the book of the prophet Jeremiah. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tablets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion, unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, 
and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the, in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice from their sorrow, and I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. Here endeth the first lesson. Oh, let us stand and sing together the Te Deum Laudamus, which you will found, find on page 10 of the Book of Common Prayer. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth God worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry along, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee, seraphim and seraphim, continually do cry. Holy, holy, 
Here beginneth the ninth verse of the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto, their, unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here endeth the second lesson. Now let us stand and sing together the Benedictus, which is found on page 14 of the prayer book. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully to hear us, and grant that we, to whom thou hast given an hearty desire to pray, may by thy mighty aid be defended and comforted in all dangers and adversities, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. You may be seated. Grace and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a blessing to be here and worship with you in the house of the Lord on this third Sunday after Trinity. Just a few announcements for uh, today. We are still in that second phase of reopening, so we have safety measures in place. There's no Holy Communion, so there aren't as many today. Uh, just to be cautious and be careful around one another. Um, coming up, I'm going to be out of town. The family and I will be out of town from July the 6th through the 20th, so be uh, aware of that. Uh, if you have any emergencies, I'm going to send out another email, so you'll, you'll see. If you don't have Archdeacon Scott's uh, Information. I'll send that out again to you uh, so you can contact him in case of emergency. He will be in town on the 19th uh, uh, of July. So, uh, But on the 12th, Father Bart Gingrich will be here, and he will be here with his family. Uh, and we, and we, he does ask that if you plan to attend on the 12th, that you wear face cover. Uh, it will be mandatory for that Sunday, um, because uh, mainly because his wife is expecting, and he wants to take every precaution for her sake. So remember that if you come on the 12th, the face covering will be mandatory. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up, I realized I had not explained why uh, I've been combining morning prayer with anti-communion the way we do it today, the way we've done it a few times already. Primarily, it's because uh, there's so much more scripture to be read when you combine those two services together. It's something that uh, the prayer book allows. It's been uh, a practice since... Um, since the English Reformation, but you combine those two parts of, of the service and you get a lot more scripture, and I think now's a good time for that. Uh, during a time of shutdown, pandemic, especially when we don't have as much music, it's good to just hear the word of the Lord. So that's, that's what we're doing. Now uh, let's stand and take your hand, hand out, and let's sing the first two verses together of Amazing Grace.
disputes are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Almighty Lord and everlasting God, vouchsafe we beseech thee to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection both here and ever we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully to hear us, and grant that we, to whom thou hast given a hearty desire to pray, may by thy mighty aid be defended and comforted in all dangers and adversities, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The epistle is written in the fifth chapter of the first epistle general of St. Peter, beginning at the fifth verse. All of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here endeth the epistle. Let us stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning at the first verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either that woman, either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she, lo if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. It may be hard to imagine this today, but southern gospel music used to be the most popular genre of, of music in the South. Uh, I don't know if that's true here. Uh, I'm from the really deep South, uh, but it was true for us. In the days before John Lennon famously asserted that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus, the most popular musicians made their living as school teachers and preachers who occasionally traveled the country with their quartet to sing gospel music in churches and at tent revivals. I remember my grandmother's favorite radio station in our hometown was 99.3. It, only, it played only southern gospel music, and it was still around even into the 1990s. One of the most popular gospel songs that I remember was written by a man named James Coates. He was a school teacher, later become minister. He was born near my hometown in Jones County, and he was educated, uh, inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame in 1991. I bet you didn't know that existed. Uh, but uh, he was indu inducted into that Hall of Fame 30 years after he died. He wrote many songs, but his most famous tune was called Where Could I Go? It was really popular. Renditions of it were sung by Elvis Presley and Emmy Lou Harris. According to one source, Coates was inspired to write the song after visiting a black neighbor of his who was on his deathbed. When Coates asked the man if he believed in Jesus and if he knew that he was going home to meet his Savior, the man replied, Where could I go but to the Lord? This simple and confident response really stuck in Coates' mind. And years later, he wrote the words to this tune. Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face that chilling hand of death, won't you tell me, where could I go but to the Lord? Now, though Coates would not have been catechized as a child, the meaning of his hymn is summed up by the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And the child answers, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, Christ is reminding all of us that we are his property. And if we would only believe that to be true, then we will know no other place where we can go for refuge and relief than to the Lord who bought us with his own blood. In our lesson from St. Luke's Gospel, Christ tells the familiar parable of the lost sheep. Luke says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. According to St. Peter, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Those who know that they do not deserve a seat at the table with Christ are precisely those whom Christ calls to eat with him. As he says elsewhere, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Pharisees who boast in their lineage from Abraham, their circumcision, and their own righteousness do not believe themselves to be sinners, and so they don't long for a Savior. As the English bishop Jeremy Taylor once said, to boast in your own righteousness is as nonsensical as boasting about being more in debt than somebody else. Since our righteousness comes from God, the more we receive from him, the more we are obliged to pay duty and tribute to him. Luke continues, And he spake this parable unto them, unto the Pharisees, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? And go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. God does resist the proud who are righteous in their own eyes. But he exalts the humble and the meek. He lifts up that lamb who says with St. Paul, O Lord, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. 
Indeed, as the prophet says, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. When St. John had his vision of God's throne in heaven, he was shown a book with seven seals, a book that when opened would bring an end to all the evil and suffering and death in the world. But when John saw it, he wept loudly because he knew that there was no one righteous enough to open that book. And then one of the elders that stood at God's throne said to him, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Beloved, Christ is your good shepherd and you are his property. And if you will confess your sins to him, if you will say to him, Lord, I know that you paid for my sinful life with your sinless and perfect life. Have mercy upon me, O Christ, for I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I am that wayward sheep, and I know that apart from you I would be completely lost. Lord, take away the root of pride from my heart. Help me to know my own sin, my own waywardness, my own self-centeredness. Teach me to love every word that proceeds from your mouth. Christ loves to save sinners, those who are lowly in their own eyes. He loves to lift up your head. And indeed, he lifts each one of us up and carries us on his shoulders, rejoicing that he has found us. And the parable says, and when, we, when he hath found it, when the shepherd hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. If you know yourself to be lost apart from Christ, then you may also know, know the joy of salvation which is not just the good feeling you get by knowing that God has saved you from sin and from eternal death, but the joy of salvation is the joy of God himself. It's the joy that God simply is in his own being. For if God is love, then God is joy. God's joy is that sunlight pouring down from the divine love that illuminates every crack and crevice of this dark earth, turning our languishing into laughter and our sadness into song. As one theologian says, the greatest joy which created beings can feel is that which they share with God. Listen to that again. The greatest joy which created beings can feel is that which they share with God. Beloved, each time you hear Christ say to you, Go in peace, my child. Your sins are forgiven you. Know that at that moment, you have stepped into the eternal light of God's joy. Indeed, Christ says, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That is the joy of reconciliation with God. The joy of finding yourself as God's dear possession, the joy of union with the Son of God and sharing one life with Him. Then Jesus tells the second part of the parable, a second parable. He says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. Uh, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Christ teaches these prideful Pharisees by means of of a second parable in order to drive home the point of humility through repentance. But with the transition from the story of the lost lamb to the lost coin, there is also a deepening of the depth of our situation and the humility that is required of us. As one theologian puts it, if a lost sheep may cry for help, yet the lost piece of money has not even that power, but is altogether the figure of one inanimate and dead, with no chance of restoration from that state, any more than Lazarus was when he was in the grave, 
unless it be by its own owner himself sought and found. When Ezekiel prophesied over sinful Israel, they were likened to dry bones. And Solomon says our situation is even worse than dry bones, for all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Now some Christians today want to focus only on the joy of salvation, the joy of knowing the Lord. And they think that to teach the joy of salvation, they must put off teaching about sin and the need for daily repentance. But the Bible tells us that you can only have the joy of redemption. You can only have the joy of being found in him when you see how lost you really are apart from him. The reason for knowing and thinking about your own sin, for acknowledging your sin before the Lord with remorse and sorrow, is not to steal your joy, but to steal your pride. The word sin in Holy Scripture means missing the mark. It's like the archer aiming for the target and coming up short. St. James warns us that our hearts are deceptive, that we are prone to make excuses for ourselves, to diagnose ourselves rather than hear the diagnosis of our heavenly physician. Indeed, we tend to think of sin as if it were only an imperfection. How many times have you heard someone say, don't judge me, Nobody's perfect. And though it's true, no one is perfect, sin is much more than imperfection. We often talk about sin like it's a common cold, when in reality it's a terminal illness. We think of it as merely missing the bullseye when it's actually missing the whole target. We think of the archer as simply having a bad day, just being off his game, when in reality he's suffering from amnesia, so that he no longer has the skill of archery or any recollection of what the target looks like. In Christ's parable, we are compared to a lifeless coin. And St. Paul says that apart from him, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But what's the point of all this focus on sin? you might say, what good will it do us to look deep, deeply into the reality of our own wickedness, of the darkness and deadness that we find within ourselves? What good does that do? Well, again, the answer is the same as before. The reason for knowing your own sin and for acknowledging your sin before the Lord with remorse and sorrow is not to steal your joy, but to steal your pride. For to know your sin is to hate your sin. To know your sin is to want to be rid of that part of you and to long for an end of your unruly desires and your hardness of heart. Indeed, the knowledge of just how lost we are drives us to put aside every other goal, every other aspiration in order to be redeemed in Jesus Christ, whom we know to be more than a simple motivator, more than a philosopher. Rather, we know him to be a savior. We know him to be the reality of God Almighty in human flesh who takes our sinful heart into himself, putting it to death, dragging it to hell, bursting out once more, transformed with the power of an incorruptible life, trampling down the power of sin, death, and hell in the greatest victory this world will ever know. For as St. Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, hath made us alive together in Christ. By grace ye are saved. Beloved, if we minimize the reality of our sin, if we minimize the reality of our terminal illness, then we maximize our pride and we minimize our redemption, even the death-conquering power of God in Jesus Christ. It's only when our focus is solely on Christ and on his righteousness, by looking away from ourselves, turning away from our own greed, pride, and lust with shame and repulsion, only then will you begin to hear those shouts of victory. And I encourage you to listen for those. Those shouts of victory as the heavenly host rejoices over you in your humble repentance. Only then 
will you know God's own joy, that you were lost to him, but now he rejoices over you because you are found. True repentance teaches what one hymn calls the deep, deep love of Jesus. Indeed, there is no such thing in the Bible as repentance without love. No such thing as sorrow for sin without God's immediate promise of forgiveness. There is no crime that is not instantly blotted out by the cross of Christ for those who truly believe. The power of forgiveness that comes only through Christ is a life-changing and world-changing cosmic force for good. Few have known that power more than John Newton, the famous hymn writer and Anglican priest. He was raised to believe in Christ, but after years at sea, his faith began to fade away as he indulged his own passions. The more he slipped into depravity, the greater a a reputation he received. He apparently had such a filthy mouth that even the worst of all the sailors found his language repulsive. He was a slave trader who even once became a slave after he abandoned his post in the Navy. It was his job to take innocent men, women, and children from their homes and to sell them as property, condemning them to a life of painful servitude and often death. It was because Newton understood by experience what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins that the possibility of God's forgiveness began to turn his heart. He didn't have a sudden conversion, but during a terrible storm at sea, he began to taste the goodness of Christ. As he heard his own mouth speak words quite different than the ones he was used to speaking. He cried out, Lord, have mercy upon us. And soon after that storm, Newton quit sailing. He married and he began to follow after Christ. He was even ordained into the Church of England and he would become famous as a hymn writer and an abolitionist. He understood that while he was capturing innocent lives and enslaving them, that all along it was he who was enslaved to sin and to the power of evil. And so knowing the power of Christ's redemption, he wrote perhaps the most famous hymn of all time, a hymn that we just sang, one that unites all types of people. It doesn't matter where you go, you can sing Amazing Grace and people will join in. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. You may not realize it, but that other famous verse in Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. It gives me chills just, uh, just reading it. That line was not actually written by Newton but it came from an old African-American spiritual song, and it was placed on the lips of Uncle Tom in Harriet Beecher Stowe's groundbreaking book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Isn't it a fitting end to Newton, the slave trader's life, that his tune of repentance, the one that we sing in Amazing Grace, joins together the voice of a former slave trader and the slaves themselves, singing together a song of repentance and deliverance through Jesus Christ. What greater picture of humility and meekness do we have than this? Beloved, there are many people today who no longer believe in this kind of deliverance or the life-changing power of God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. You can see it on the news and on the internet that we live in a day when you're no longer allowed to simply repent for what you've said or done in the past. For many no longer believe that genuine repentance is good enough. Many believe that forgiveness cannot be given until justice is served and voices are silenced. Today Christ is telling you that there is and will always be true forgiveness in Him. 
especially for sinners like you and me. So, let us repent of our sins. Let us rejoice in repentance and give thanks for such a great salvation, one that is capable of uniting all types of people in one voice of praise and thanksgiving. Let us rejoice with the angels and with Christ who takes lowly sinners like us and lifts us up on his shoulders as prized possessions. Let us resolve to live now in light of what Christ has done and will do for us despite our sin. And let us hear the blessing of St. Peter again, who says, The God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now let us pray for the whole state. by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee mercifully to accept our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacrament. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. By name we pray for Alice, Barbara, Connie, Dorothy, Elizabeth, Jill, Carrie, Rain, Vonda, and Warren, and all who are affected by the coronavirus pandemic. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only advocate, mediator, and advocate. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, who says unto thine apostles, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of thy church, and grant to it that peace and unity which is according to thy will, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Now the peace of God which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Now let us stand and sing the final two stanzas of Amazing Grace.
to serve the Lord. This concludes our service.